Hello and a warm welcome to Econoday Unplugged on Tuesday, 5th of March 2024. On today's edition, we have Mark Pender on the US East Coast, Max Sarto, hopefully, will be joining us later in um, British Columbia, Brian Jackson in Sydney, and I'm Jeremy Hawkins in London. So inflation is still trending down across much of the globe, albeit very recently in some cases, perhaps not quite as quickly as forecast. Even so, many central banks remain reluctant to cut official interest rates and see more risks in easing too early than too late. In large part, this will be due to their determination to protect and, of course, extend the hard-won disinflationary gains made so far. However, it also very probably reflects worries about the damage that might be done to, what shall we say, already strained policy credibility should interest rates suddenly have to be hiked again to tackle a renewed acceleration in prices. All of which bolsters the chances of interest rate cuts being delivered both slowly and in only small increments. So, Mark, before we get to the economy, how much of a factor in policy setting do you think this sort of credibility issue is for the Fed? The Fed has this time around, this cycle has really, I think, uh, done a good job. Um, there hasn't been uh, a lot of questions. Uh, and I don't think that that really is um, a danger for the Fed right now. They do talk about the risk of uh, having to uh, raise rates uh, should they cut too early, mm -hmm. but it's not, I don't think, anything that um, they're, you know, they're overly concerned with. Uh, that would be a, a factor, but it's like you say, I think they'll go, in, it, when they do finally go, uh, they will uh, to, assuming that the data continues to kind of unfold it as it has, that they'll probably go slowly and carefully. Uh, has, and they've maintained this, um, you know, this maximum rate, as it were. Let, uh, you know, in their last uh, meeting, uh, they said it's probably the, they're probably at at the peak of the rate cycle. They had been saying, hitting at that in prior meetings, but the minutes of the last meeting made that a, a clear statement among the uh, members so okay let me ask you i mean we've had what growth last year came in what just over three percent so well up on 2022 and that's despite mm. all the tightening we've had and tighter financial conditions you know mm. we also had you know, a big backup in long-term interest rates consumer spending did pretty well mm. reading some signs of an upturn in the housing market at least in the second half of the year stock mm. market's been at or close to to record mm. highs mm. looking at i know you don't have a great Great, uh, great confidence in some of these Fed now casts, but for what it's worth, the Atlanta mm -hmm. one, I think, is talking over 2% in the first quarter. So I guess with the labour market still so tight, did, should they actually be thinking about cutting interest rates in the first place? Well, they have to listen to the markets and they have to listen, to, they have to take all the questions from uh, from people like you and me uh, regarding uh, rate cuts. And if they're already thinking that the rates are kind of at a terminal high, then the next move would the sensible move or, or you know, is going to be a cut. Um, but that would be funny if they begin to take that talk off the table, which I don't think that they really can. It's also an election year, you know, of course, in the U.S. And they don't, you know, they typically steer clear of being mm -hmm. accused of, of any possible, uh, you know, a favoritism, political uh, you know, uh, using interest rates to support uh, the incumbent, for instance, that would, you know, that, that would hint at pushing out um, a rate cut. But if they push it out, you know, later in the year, right when the election is is due, that, that, might, not, that might not be so good either. So, they, you know, if they don't do it in the summer, they might just skip and then do it uh, at the end of next year or at the end of this year or at the beginning of next year. Um, OK, Look, I, was, I was going to ask you on that. I mean, it seems I mean, not we don't have to go back very long to, you know, to see financial markets. We're talking about a cut as soon as this month mm -hmm. or certainly in May. Yeah. time. Now, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the market, you know, the, the futures prices are saying that that's unlikely now. Uh, June perhaps is a possibility, but March and May seem to be extremely unlikely. What do you mm -hmm. think would need to happen? In, 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 economy wise for them to actually come out and say no in actual fact we're going to cut 25 basis points now you know before when the market's actually talking about well let's just talk about inflation first the inflation mm -hmm. has been moderating and it uh, in, in, and cooling nicely but it's still not at target level and average hourly earnings we'll get to that in a minute but the last one and the, and this is a, a me, the key measure of wage inflation that was 4.5 percent 
in January, which is more than double what they want. Uh, the CPI overall is at um, 3.1 and the core is at 3.9. So uh, even though their PCE indexes are cooler, um, about a half point and a full point cooler, they're still uh, above target. So they're, if at these levels, you could cut if the underlying economy was weak, but the underlying economy is not weak, as you were saying. Also, you know, we had a big jump in uh, uh, consumption expenditures in January, which points to another uh, strong contribution mm -hmm. fr from the consumer in the first quarter. So that hasn't slowed down. So they don't need they don't need to cut rates to stimulate the economy. And let's turn to Friday's uh, payroll numbers. Um, the uh, Econoday's consensus following January is way over uh, the top 353,000 growth in non-farm payroll. That included a sharp upper revision to December. So now they're back into the uh, you know trying to estimate a lower number, which is 190, which is a perfectly fine strong number, and that's the consensus. The range Econoday's range is 95, which is would you know be on the low side to 260. But uh, the last month was way beyond. The higher ex the higher expectation. The unemployment rate is low at 3.7. Uh, the, the participation rate, which has been lagging in the U.S., is even starting to improve improve at 6, uh, 62.5. But the average hourly earnings, the kind of day's consensus for that is from January 0.6 percent monthly rate, which is a super strong, super overheated rate. Half of that 0.3. Uh, which would be a some point two was probably what they would want, but point three is not so bad, and there and that would be four point three percent on the year uh, is the expectation down down a couple of tenths. So they don't need to cut rates as long as it's, uh, the uh, job markets are strong, and the job market almost is hinting at overheating, mm -hmm. which gets back to your original point. What happens if they just don't do nothing and they do nothing and the economy starts to pick up? Then you know. Then they're at the point of well, then that we might have to raise rates. It's hard to believe. It's actually hard to believe that they could start raising rates. But um, I but guess you never know. We could slow down the pace of which they're going to going to ease if we keep seeing numbers. Yes. Up. Yes. Definitely. Okay, brilliant. So all eyes on the employment numbers for this week. Um, right, we don't have Max with us, unfortunately. So just a quick fill in on Canada, since we do have a Bank of Canada meeting taking place tomorrow. Background, I guess, is that the Canadian economy has been, well, it's really been disappointing for a little while now. If we look at Econoday's uh, relative performance index, which sees how the economy or economic activity in general has been performing versus expectations. It's currently running at, what, minus 15, and we strip inflation out of that, it's minus Minus one, so not that different from zero. But that said, it's been negative. Both indices have been negative. In some cases, quite strongly negative for most of 2024 so far. So the background to the meeting tomorrow is one in which an economy has been underperforming. Now that said, fourth quarter GDP was up 0.2% quarter on quarter, which means that Canada at least avoided a recession. Um, and indeed, that was above the Bank of Canada's own call for zero growth. But within that, uh, final domestic demand fell 0.2%. And although consumption is up, business investment, at least gross fixed investment, has been falling steadily for, for a while now. Business investment is down almost one and a half percent, and that's the sixth fall in the last seven quarters. Much the same applies to housing. So really, growth just came out of net exports. We saw a big increase coming through in exports of goods and services, which added about 0.5 percentage points. So in other words, the uh, Canadian economy at the moment is struggling. And, and it will certainly seem in terms of a general background to it that's setting the scene for, let's say, an interest rate cut sooner rather than later. It does appear to be the case that the BOC wants to see further evidence that inflation is moving, or at least we're going to keep within target. I should mention that the January CPI was a lot softer than expected. It took the headline rate down to 2.9%. So that's actually back within the target range of 1% to 3%. The core rate, the core average rate for the BOC's preferred indices, that dropped to 3.4% from 3.7%. Again, that was on the soft side of expectation. So you know, the big picture at the moment does appear to be you know, building up, but we will see an interest rate cut before too long. Tomorrow, 
very unlikely. 10th of April is a possibility, or certainly by the one after that, the 5th of June, we could well see the BOC moving. All right, over to Asia then. Uh, let me quickly just mention some bits and pieces on Japan. Um, again, as Max has talked about on uh, numerous podcasts um, in the past, really it's still the case that the, the government, the BOJ, waiting to see what comes out of the current wage round to determine whether or not we will see interest rates finally being hiked and the BOJ moving off its um, ultra-loose monetary policy. Now, interestingly, the government was actually forced earlier on today to deny a media report that uh, the government or BOJ is considering an e- or calling an end to deflation which would certainly increase speculation about pulling the plug on the monetary policy sooner rather than later. We had some inflation figures out earlier on this week, uh, the Tokyo data uh, for February, which was a lot higher than expected, uh, suggests that you know, the underlying trend now inflation is beginning to move in the direction that the BOJ wants to see. Now, all that said, uh, the government in February downgraded its assessment economy for the first time since last November. They are pointing to signs of weakness in private consumption as well as output. And certainly the cabinet office itself warned that there are some areas of the economy which perhaps aren't doing as well as it could be. Um, nonetheless, what you can say certainly is that investor interest in Japan has improved significantly over the course of the last month or so. Uh, what late last month we saw the stock market finally climb past its all-time closing high a level it been stuck at what well, hasn't taken out i should say since the light ni- late 1980s so big picture i think is still we're looking towards a hike in the bank of japan's overnight rate uh, a near-term one still seems pretty unlikely at st- this stage but it does seem as if uh, financial markets be looking more and more at the 26th of april by which time they should have at least some of the wage data that they're waiting to look at before finally pulling the trigger. Right, that said, let's go to Brian and China. Um, Brian, where do we start? Let's just start quickly with the RPI, the Relative Performance Indices. And we're currently running just on the overall index at minus 43. Um, if we adjust it for inflation, both these measures have pretty well been negative since the middle of January. So the Chinese economy, as you've talked about in the past, has been undershooting expectations. Now, they've just set themselves a 5% growth target. Do you think that's actually realistic without some additional stimulus from be it monetary policy or fiscal accommodation? Well, let's say it's ambitious at, at the moment, definitely. Um, so, you know, they set a similar target last year and, and sort of just managed to sort of scrape in. So I, I think that was sort of, you know, the main reason why they decided to go ahead that, you know, they they were able to achieve it and they should be able to, you know, hopefully uh, get close again this year. But um, I agree that, you know, it's been a, a very subdued start to the year. Uh, and so um, it, it may require some additional measures. We, we know that in the last, um, you know, f- few weeks they have, Sort of, um, you know, the reduced loan prime rate for the five year to try and get mm-hmm. mortgage, uh, mortgage rates lower. Uh, they've they've um, uh, tinkered with the reserve requirements to try and improve liquidity as well. So they have done a few things to to try and get um, uh, a little bit more liquidity into the system. But uh, you know, we, we we do still I think uh, require a little bit more to to really uh, kick start this economy. That said, um, of course, we are sort of flying blind at the moment in terms mm-hmm. of of the data. Um, we're in that sort of period, at the, which happens at the every every year, where um, the, the numbers are very much impacted by the timing of Lunar New Year holidays, and so it's a little bit hard to to get a, a, a firm reading on what's going on. Um, we, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll get uh, the combined January February data uh, for for most of the key activity indicators published. So that obviously will uh, give us a better indication of of how things are going, but. Um, the time being, um, you know, we, we don't really have um, a, a very clear reading on on how the economy has started since the start of the year. OK, let me ask you a couple of questions on this. Um, well, I say non-economic, but in terms of the way policy seems to be working at the moment, there seems to be some disquiet by 
uh, the decision of the National People's Congress not to have this press briefing at the end of the Congress itself, which presumably is going to mean that you know the understanding in financial markets or elsewhere about what policy is trying to do and how it's going to get there is going to be that much more clouded. And also the fact that you know, regulators have been steadily tightening their grip on the stock market, you know, preventing some short positions being taken out, out and all this sort of thing. Um, should these two actions be read as perhaps the authorities are more concerned about the state of the economy than you know what what their ordinary language might imply? Well, you know, uh, economic uh, policy from Beijing is opaque at the best of the times. Um, you know, you don't really get anywhere near the level of detail and clarity uh, about what they're trying to do that you see in uh, you know, other major economies. So that's just a, a you know a, a baseline uh, scenario. Really, um, very hard to uh, to read. Uh, you know what they're planning a lot of the times, but I, I think you're right. When things are tough, uh, they do tend to become even more um, limited in in what they're trying to explain to to markets and to and to the general public. So that 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 is a risk um, going forward that we you know, we just don't really have a good reading on on what they're planning to do. Um, but you know, hopefully we will get a little bit of uh, detail from from the National People's Congress. It's one of the few opportunities we do mm -hmm. have have. You know, someone give a statement on, on what they're planning. But, uh, you know, I think in general, they're obviously concerned about the stock market. They're concerned about the property market. They're concerned about the exchange rate. There's a lot of factors uh, that uh, are sort of limiting uh, their options at the moment. And so, um, you know, it's just a, a matter of trying to, um, you know, read the tea leaves and, and see what they're planning to do. But, um, you know, we're, we're always running a little bit blind. Yeah, and if so much can be swept under the carpet. All right, Link, thank you for that. Um, right, your neck of the woods then, Australia. Seems that inflation is starting to come down, perhaps a little bit quicker than expected now. Um, and of course, well, the employment market has been very soft, at least for January report anyway. I know we've got another one coming up soon, haven't we? So kind of what's going on? Um, is there a possibility perhaps the RBA might have perhaps slightly over-tightened policy or left rates too high for too long? Or is just do you think this is just sort of volatility in the monthly figures? I think there is a, a little bit of volatility in the monthly figures. Um, I've I've sort of been um, noting a few times in 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 my reports, just that there are a few sort of seasonal things that are, are working a little bit differently in Australia now than what they used to. Um, so particularly with employment and retail sales, we're seeing a little bit of, sh of a shift in the way that consumers and uh, workers actually operate over the summer months here in Australia. Um, you know, retail sales. Uh, you know, we used to do all our Christmas spending. Yeah, just very late before Christmas. Uh, now we've uh, sort of followed the the Black Friday uh, uh, sales that we see in America. Right. Uh, we we have more spending in late November rather than December than compared with previous years. And similar with the uh, the employment data, um, we we seem to be taking uh, more of our annual leave in the summer months over you know the summer weeks over January than what we used to. And so there's a whole bunch of Sort of, and you know, the officials suggest that this might be, you know, related to the post-pandemic sort of changes in in the way we we live our lives, basically. So um, there has been a little bit, I think, um, uh, thinking within the statistic department here in Australia about how to, um, you know, uh, account for these difference uh, differences in in seasonal patterns. So I would say that there's been a little bit of volatility in in the data, but generally speaking, um, you know, I think the employment market is still pretty solid. Um, uh, retail sales definitely was subdued towards the end of the year, um, but um, you know we'll sort of get a better handle, I think, as we move past the summer months. Uh, exactly about the state of both those those things. Okay, and we'll get an update. So it's, it's just in a few hours' time, isn't it, on the uh, fourth quarter GDP? Um, Correct. What, yeah. do you, got any idea what's expected on that? Uh, what do we have expected? Um, I mean, it's it's kind of not um, too historic, is it already, or? Yeah, it, it's sort of, um, you know, obviously um, based on uh, monthly data that's already come out. So it doesn't really uh, have a, sorry, I'm just trying to get the consensus here. Yeah, 0.3% is what we've got for the consensus. So um, that's a pretty, um, you know, stable from what it was the previous quarter. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, anything going on in New Zealand um, our clients should be aware of? Uh, not really. Um, you know, the, the funny thing about New Zealand was, is they, they typically have a very long summer break between policy meetings at, at, at the RBNZ. Um, so they, they met a couple of weeks ago after they hadn't met since uh, late November. Uh, and there wasn't really much of a change in the, in the stance uh, from 
the RBNZ or in in sort of the tone of their statement as well. So they're still very much um, of the view that policy needs to stay restrictive um, uh, and no really indication in, in their language that they're, they're thinking about making a move uh, anytime soon to, to withdraw some of that, um, that those policy rate hikes that you know they delivered earlier. So um, yeah, it's just a matter of of waiting for this uh, for inflation to to fall further. It, it is starting to move in the right direction, but I don't see that there being a big uh, appetite to to move too quickly. So, you know, as you were saying in the in the US, um, you know, there's there's definitely um, you know, a, a move to to really be focused on on the inflation outlook for the time being, um, and that's I think also very similar uh, with the RBA. Uh, with their last meeting uh, early in the month, uh, sorry, no, early last month now, they were adamant that, you know, there's still a chance that they'll raise interest rates. I don't think that's particularly the the, the most likely scenario, but they're leaving that on the table to just, I think, to indicate that uh, getting inflation lower is still the main priority. All right, fair enough. Um, let me, well, for my side, anyway, ask you last about India. I noticed uh-huh. that their fourth quarter GDP was it almost eight and a half percent year on year, if I remember rightly, which is the strongest we've seen in quite a while. So, I mean, is the India? I know you've talked up the Indian economy back end of last year when we were discussing it on the podcast. Um, I guess you know we can say so far it looks pretty good there. And does this mean that there's limited downside to RBI interest rates? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, the 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 activity data out of India continues to be you know, pretty positive. Industrial production, um, you know, we have the PMI surveys this week, and you know, you know, whereas you're seeing 40s and and early and low 50s elsewhere in the region in India, uh, their their index is up around 60. So very strong uh, conditions in both the services and the manufacturing sector in India, and I, I think that just gives the green light for the RBI to continue to be focused on upside risks to the inflation network. That's the the main. Uh, topic of of their recent statements, uh, identifying and um, highlighting those those risks, and so I, th- I think that just means that's going to be the main uh, uh, consideration in in upcoming policy meetings. Okay, fair enough. Anything else from your side? No, that's it. Just um, you know, as I said before, the you know we're in that funny period of of data out of uh, Asia with the Lunar New Year holidays. So uh, basically. This year we had the Lunar New Year holidays in February, whereas last year they were in January. So that does um, impact the year-over-year uh, numbers that we get right across the region. So um, just be aware of that, and um, soon we'll get all the February numbers, and then we'll be able to get a really uh, clean handle on, on on how the data are tracking right across the region. Okay, lovely. Thanks for that, Brian. Right, let's round it off with um, Europe then. We have what the ECB meeting taking place this week on Thursday. Nothing really expected to come out of that, but certainly there are clear signs of widening splits within the governing council about you know, just when interest rates should be cut. Um, in terms of the economy, well, um, certainly looking at our consensus data of, uh, on how the actuals are coming <laughs> since the last ECB meeting, by and large, the Eurozone economy, while it's still very sluggish, we should certainly say that at the outset here it has actually typically slightly outperformed market expectations and that's helped to ease a little bit of pressure on the ecb that the market's been uh, putting on with regards to coming out an easing policy um in terms of sort of my opening comments uh, in the intro about you know which is worse to, to ease too late or to, you know, to leave policy too too strong whatever um by and large it's a case from we saw from the january minutes that the ecb is much more worried about easing too soon even if it does mean pushing in the economy into recession. And indeed, uh, Joachim Nagel, who heads up the Bundesbank, by all means one of the most hawkish in the in the governing council, to quote him, he said it'd be fatal if the ECB cuts rates too only too early, only for inflation to rebound. And although that may not be uh, completely a, a heartfelt sense across the rest of the governing council members, it would very much seem to represent the view of the majority. Um, in terms of ECB itself, then what's it looking at? Well, clearly it's still all about inflation. And I guess we can say the flash February data we had out back end of last week um, is kind of good and bad. I mean, inflation is still falling in the eurozone. Uh, the headline rate was down to 2.6 percent um, in the early Feb data. That was down from 2.8 percent at the beginning of the year. But it was a little bit higher than expected. And the narrow core rate, which certainly financial markets very much concentrate upon, uh, that eased from 3.3 to 3.1 percent. But again, uh, quite comfortably beat, in fact, beat the market expectations on that point. And the real issue for them is really what's going on in the service sector. 
uh, which is their big concern. Inflation in there currently stands at 3.9%. And to all intents and purposes, it's been around that level now ever since November. So although the good side of the economy has seen prices decelerate quite sharply, indeed, goods inflation is below the target right now. Services is proving remarkably sticky. And this is the big concern for the ECB because, as Mark was talking about with uh, his side in the labour market being very tight, it's exactly the same in Europe, particularly the Eurozone, despite the fact that growth over here has been lagging miles behind what we've seen the other side of the pond. Um, So really, I think until we start to see certainly some further improvements in most of the core uh, inflation measures, and particularly what's going in the service sector, then the ECB itself is going to be very reluctant to come out and cut interest rates. So in terms of this third, as I mentioned, there's virtually no chance, I think, or indeed markets believe, of any move on interest rates. And 11th of April, which about a month or so ago, a number of investors were looking at as a possibility, I guess can be seen as a possibility. But unless we get some very soft figures between now and then, I still think that's too uh, too soon. Perhaps in at least the earliest time for a possible cut, and even then only 25 basis points. Uh, we're talking about the back end of the second quarter on the 6th of June. In terms of the UK, um, the Bank of England's next meeting will be on the 21st of March and much akin to the ECB. No one's really talking about an interest rate cut there. Indeed, if anything, since the last um, Bank of England meeting, market expectations on rate cuts have been pushed quite a lot further out. A lot of it still has to do with what's going on in wages and the labour market as we talked about on previous podcasts, the labour market, despite the stats office now maintaining uh, the, the revised sets of figures, are more reliable than we've, than we've been having to, to, uh, to look at over the past several months now. There's still a concern about just how accurate they are. The Bank of England is basically having to rely more and more upon what its regional agents are saying with regards to how the labour market is performing when it's deciding what it wants to do with interest rates. And on that front, they come out and suggested that where it looks as if wage Wages are slowing, but they're slowing from a high level and only very slowly. And if that's the case, then there's enough you know, hawks on the, bank, on the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee uh, to keep interest rates on hold for perhaps several months yet. Um, and I think the back end of what the second quarter will be very much the earliest we could see the Bank of England moving. Um, in actual fact, looking at uh, you know, the lots of the relative uh, performance indices from Econa Day, they've been running uh, in positive numbers now since the middle of February. And the bank may well acknowledge that uh, the first quarter economy is going to be rather stronger than originally expected. I guess we should mention that the UK is officially in recession as a result of the uh, middle of February when they had the updated fourth quarter GDP numbers. But if the first quarter data so far are anything to go by, that recession is going to be both very short lived and very mild. And that is reason in itself for expecting the bank to be that much more cautious about when it finally comes out and decides to, to trim its bank rate. Uh, the other big issue for the U, but probably for the UK between now and then, apart from obviously from the actual numbers themselves and the labour market data and the CPI out, in, out next week, will be on Wednesday when we'll get the, the annual budget update from uh, Chancellor Hunt. There's so much pressure on him to come out and cut um, cut taxes, be it income, be it national insurance surcharges or whatever, given the state of the Conservatives and the opinion polls at the moment. One poll which came out yesterday suggested uh, the, the Tory party his popularity was an all-time record low since uh, that poll particularly began back in the 1970s. So all in all, um, it's going to be a very difficult one for the Chancellor to manage. Um, his party wants him to come out and then reduce taxes to boost uh, the party's popularity. But as far as financial markets are concerned, they're well aware that there's far too much budget deficit and borrowing taking place at the moment. And there is something of a, a genuine concern that we could see almost a repeat of the disastrous September 2022 budget when Liz Tr- Truss was prime minister and the guilt market almost collapsed on inflation and supply side worries. So for choice, I expect that tomorrow we will see some politically aimed easing on the fiscal side, but I don't think the charts are dare do too much simply because of the repercussions from the financial markets themselves. A round off with Switzerland, uh, the Swiss National Bank will also be announcing its decision on the 21st of March, so same time, or well, same day, I should say, as the Bank of England. And that's one of the really interesting ones, because when you look at the Swiss data, uh, the real economy is at best doing OK, 
although in the last quarter it's really relied upon exports for growth and inflation which of course is the bugbear as far as the SMB itself is concerned is continuing to fall. The February data showed inflation running at just 1.2 percent so well below the kind of near 2 percent mark that the Swiss National Bank tries to target. The core rate was down at 1.2 percent. Indeed if we sort of compare it with the eurozone the Swiss HICP so the harmonized index of consumer prices the annual rate on that one is 1.2 percent as well so that compares with 2.6 percent in the eurozone so you pull it all together in terms of those economic statistics and there's little reason for supposing that the SMB won't pull the trigger on rates later on this month all that said it still appears to be the case from what they're saying that they don't want to be seen just like many other central banks to to be cutting interest rates too soon before they're completely comfortable with the idea that inflation is going to stabilize all in its target zone and a big issue for them is again once again like so many other central banks for labor market although we have seen some signs of a gradual loosening there in terms of the unemployment data and in some of the payroll data as well uh, the bottom line is the unemployment rate is still extremely low Historically, it's very low. The market is very tight. And so uh, the Swiss National Bank is that much worried about cutting interest rates now could lead to an increase in demand that the supply side of the economy simply can't cope with and lead to higher, higher inflation again. So SMB on back end of this month, interest rate cut. Certainly it is a possibility, despite the fact that markets appear to have ruled it out completely now. Uh, but much more likely is we'll see something uh, back end of the second quarter or indeed they could even wait until we get into the third quarter. Right. Well, that's it for Europe. Anybody else got anything else they'd like yes, to say? Uh, for Jeremy, Jeremy yep. this is Mark. You know, I was thinking um, uh, in your uh, we, we started talking about the Fed at the beginning of the of the call and you were talking about uncertainty in monetary policy. And that, you know, leads me to ask about dissent. I was just looking back, you know, there hasn't been any dissent at all on the at the Fed since June 2022. So that's a year and a half without mm -hmm. even a, a, a vote, not even an abstinent, you know, I mean, it's just the vote is unanimous again and again and again and again, which, you know, gets to the certainty with monetary policy. Now, how about Europe and the Bank of England, for instance? Well, um, of course, in, in terms of, uh, well, the ECB first, they don't actually take a, a vote per se. It just comes down to a, kind of a general agreement they managed to come out with. Um, but it's quite clear from the comments from various uh, governing council members that, you know, some are looking for a relatively early cut and others uh, think, well, there's no guarantee we actually get a cut this year at all. So there's certainly disagreement there. In terms of the Bank of England, yeah, same story, really. We got, we got a very mixed picture here. As of the last meeting, we saw the two well, two of the most hawkish members of the monetary policy committee wanting to hike interest rates again by 25 basis points uh we had the, the most dovish member uh calling for now for 25 basis point cut and the six remaining members thinking well probably look we're not sure what we're supposed to be doing um and leaving interest rates on hold so i think when it comes down to you know which central bank is sending the clearest message out of that lot well you know well, pra well, all praise to the FOMC because you say they've got united front, whereas elsewhere there's quite clear, clearly confusion amongst the policymakers themselves as to what they should be doing. But that leads to the rhetorical question. In confusion, it's not maybe not necessarily bad. It just may be a transparent, honest debate. So the the the, the abstract question, Jeremy, is is uh, dissent good or bad for central bank policy credibility? Well, ultimately, I suppose I'd say it's bad in the sense that I think a central bank wants to present a united front. You know, look, we have all our policymakers who are allegedly very bright, intelligent people, and we all think that rates should be doing X. And you go with that. When you start getting particular like the Bank of England, I think it's unfortunate when uh, you've got, I mean, Swati Dingra, who is the... Uh, the, the loan dub at the moment. It's unfortunate, I think, when you've got you know one member wanting to cut interest rates, two members wanting to raise rates. Then for financial markets, it starts coming across, well, look, the central bank really doesn't know what it's supposed to be doing. Mm. So if you're looking there for guidance, well, whatever guidance they give you, it's not going to carry as much weight as if the FOMC all come out and say, well, look, we think rates should be on hold or we think rates should be going down. 
But I think, right, having said that, so I must wrap this up, we've gone for too long. But yes, I think the fact that you do have an open discussion and see what the central bankers are saying has to be good news in the sense that, you know, let's be honest, central banks get it right. They certainly get it wrong. It does introduce, you know, different scenarios which ultimately need to be discussed to try and work out which one is most likely to be appropriate. On which note, yes, thanks for the question. Um, that's about it, I guess, for Unplugged as far as today's concerned. Um, bottom line, of course, is for all these central banks, it's still down to the economic data in general, and at least for now, inflation in particular. So be sure to keep up to date with all the key market moving data and events in Economy global economic calendar. On behalf of Mark, Brian and me, thanks as always for listening, and we'll be back again very soon. Bye for now. <laughs>